This is the Savvy Investor radio show and podcast with Mike Kinnett and Ryan Herbert of Prostatus Financial. Mike is a financial planner and estate planning attorney with a master's degree in taxation and four-time Amazon best-selling author. Ryan is an 11-time five-star wealth management award winner and top-ranked financial advisor by Forbes. For decades, the Prostatus Financial team has been helping families build successful retirements and lasting legacies. Now, the Savvy Investor radio show and podcast. It's Bruce Elliott. We're here with Mike Kinnett of Prostatus Financial. Mike is a financial planner, estate planning attorney with a master's in tax. Great to see you, Mike. Great to see you, Bruce. Mike, we've been told to save money on our 401ks and to pay taxes later. Well, now that day has come and we need that money. We're shocked to see that potentially up to a third is going to be going to taxes. Anything we can do about this? Yeah, it's actually insane that somebody made a recommendation to you to say that we're going to set you up in retirement to lose 20 to 40 percent right off the top to taxes. So, yes, you should absolutely be sitting down with an advisor who understands investments and taxes and can have a conversation about both of those things together because the reality is our tax system we get to opt into it, right? The Supreme Court has said you get to choose which tax bracket you want to be in. And if you properly structure your retirement income, you can choose to pay that 20, 30, 40% off the top, or you can choose to pay zero. But it starts by actually having a tax plan as you go into retirement. Bruce, because so many of the listeners are worried about taxes now, and quite frankly, for their family in the future, we're going to personally run a tax plan and analysis for them. This is complimentary for the next five callers with 500000 or more saved for retirement. So don't let taxes be your biggest expense in retirement. My Connect and ProStatus Financial can help you with a free tax planning analysis. Get started today by calling 866-597-1040, 866-597-1040, and at ProStatusFinancial.com. Okay, if you have a traditional IRA, and now, of course, people are saying, no, you want to get into a Roth. If you have the traditional is it advisable to withdraw it from the traditional and put it into the Roth, or do you still pay that tax penalty uh, that you have when you're withdrawing your money? So the conversion from an IRA to a Roth, converting it into that tax-free bucket of money, there's no penalty for doing the conversion. It doesn't matter how old you are. There may be a tax bill, and certainly you want to explore, does it make sense for the conversion in the first place? And, And there's a lot of factors to go into it, but What we do is we look at what the tax rates are today and what your income needs are today versus what are the tax rates going to be when you turn 73, 74, 75, and you're forced to take the money out, right? Because Uncle Sam says you have to take the money out because we want our share of your hard-earned money, right? So you have to compare what the tax rates are today versus what the tax rates are tomorrow and it takes about 10 to 12 years to break even on, a, on this transition. So there's lots of moving parts, and each person's situation is a little bit unique. But you need to do the analysis, right? You just can't ignore it and hope for the best. You want to know, are you in the best tax situation possible? So is the, the answer is, yes, you should explore it. Should you do it? Maybe. Okay, uh, your, your date that you must begin to withdraw uh, is 70 and a half. It's the year you turn 70 and a half. So were you to have turned 70 and a half uh, earlier this year, when you do your taxes for next year, that's the year that you're going you're gonna to have to say, all right, here's my whatever it is percentage uh, to, that I have to withdraw this year. So with that as a background, if you're 65 years old right now uh, and you're taking a look at it and say, well, do I then have to guess as to what tax rates are going to be in five or six years? Or do I simply say, I'm going to bite the bullet now and do it? How do you figure that math? Well, so fortunately, over the last several years, they've actually changed that required minimum distribution age. It was seven and a half for a long, longest time. Um, the Secure Act 1.0 in 2020 changed it to uh, age 72. And just uh, recently, Secure Act 2.0 changed it to 73. And, and in about another decade or so, it'll go to 75. So we do have a little bit of wiggle room for the, your 65-year-old. The answer to the question about how do we determine what the tax rates are going to be, the idea of converting is not a one and done thing. This is an ongoing process. So every year you're going to be looking at your income this year, and then you're going to make a comparison to here's the reasonable rates of return I'm going to have. Here's how much I estimate the value of my account is going to be at you know 72 when I'm mm-hmm. forced to take it out. Here are what the tax rates are that we know about, right? So we know we know in general everything you loved about the t- Trump tax cuts, everything you love about it. They go away in 2026. Everything you hated about it, you know, the loss of deductions, unreimbursed business expenses, all that, you know, margin interest, all the stuff that you don't like about losing, 
all those things stay. So we get all the bad back, but we don't get to keep the good. But we do look out in 2026, 27. We know what the tax rates are going to be minimally, but because it's an ongoing annual event that you have to compare, every year we make that adjustment based upon the knowledge that we have in front of us for the future. But well, really, do you really know? Uh, let's assume uh, that uh, Donald Trump is the nominee for the Republicans and he wins. Two different assumptions. Do we then say we do know for sure what your tax rate minimum is going to be? Or is he likely to come and say, we're cutting those bad boys? Well, let, let's assume Trump does cut taxes or maintains where it is to, to continue to push the economy forward, right? Because right. we know that lower tax rates mean the average consumer is spending more money because they don't save the money. I mean, corporate America uses that money to buy back shares of stock. Right. We spend our money. If we get an extra hundred dollars, we spend it. So the idea would be, you know, this year we look at the tax rates and we look at what they're going to be in 2026 and we make a decision. And then in 2025, we make, you know, we do the same analysis in 2026, we do the same analysis so that if in fact he gets elected in, in 24 and he's the president and he says, we're going to change the tax rates or keep them the same, then yes, we may have made a decision based upon misinformation, meaning we made an assumption of what it was going to be. And now it's lower. But from this perspective, as long as they don't lower tax rates from where they are today, converting based upon higher tax rates or today's tax rates still makes sense, right? So if you convert today in, let's say, the 24% tax bracket, and it turns out Trump gets reelected, and it turns out that he he put, presses the, 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 the tax cuts forward, well, converting at 24% is still not a bad idea. You didn't pay extra because it's going to be 24% when you take it out. So it's a wash from that perspective. Okay, now if, if on the other hand, if Joe Biden is the nominee for the Democrats and he wins, there's a, a strong possibility uh, as I'm reading the tea leaves, that the Democrats will want to push the tax rates up uh, for us. I mean, after all, the rich get, you know, they get all the advantages, blah, blah, blah. The misinformation about you know, the rich people only pay 3% of their income and all that kind of stuff. So th- the push is going to be to make it more expensive. The justification is we're just going after rich people. But you and I know bluntly there's, the rich people don't have enough money. Uh, so, well, it, so it always creeps down to the middle class. Well, and, and the reality is, is that you don't even have to read the tea leaves. Biden has said, I want to raise taxes, right? I mean, the only reason why he has not been able to raise taxes is he doesn't control enough of the Senate. So as long as, as, long as he doesn't win and Democrats don't get 60% of the Senate, that doesn't happen. But let's assume for a minute that Biden does manage to push through that tax increase that he has asked for over and over again that's in his agenda, and he increases tax rates. And, and you are 100% correct. People think... You know, and I'm doing the air quotes, I'm not rich. I recognize that you and I realize from a real dollar sense that we're not rich. But you're right. The Democrats and Biden think everybody's rich. Everybody's rich, except for maybe the Democrats and Biden. They're not rich so, because we don't want their tax bill. But, but you're right. If they raise the taxes, then this was a no-brainer and you should have been converting years ago. Mike, in your book, Nothing is Certain But Death and Taxes, you say, and I quote you, uh, how can a person give you investment advice without understanding the tax implications on that advice. Well, why should we work with somebody who understands this? Let's make the analogy as we get older and a doctor, right? So when you're younger, you went to a pediatrician. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know how it is for you, but at 61, every time I go see my primary care physician, she's sending me to like five other doctors for something, right? <laughs> and, and, and I'm running all over town trying to make sure all these doctors, I'm doing the things that she's recommended I'm doing. I'm talking to all these other doctors. And then when I go see my primary caregiver, she has no idea what those other doctors said. She has to go read it. So she's not actually in tune with what my total health looks like because she's not paying attention to all of them until I show back up at her office to have a follow-up conversation with right. her. Okay. So, so that's the problem with our industry. And I mean, I, I blame myself, our industry for this problem. Right now, most people sit down with a financial advisor and they might be great about, you know, here's your stocks, bonds, mutual funds, annuities, whatever he sells them. He might do a really great job with them. But as soon as you ask him a question about, well, what are the tax implications? His hands go up. Sorry, man, that's not my job. Remember Chico on the man, not my job, man. So go talk to your CPA and you might go sit down with your CPA and the CPA might have really good tax plan. And although my, my experience with most tax preparers and professionals are their historians that put numbers on a page. But as soon as you ask that CPA, okay, I understand what's going on, but when I pass away and this money needs to go to my heirs, is it, no, 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 that's not my job, man. That's not my job. Yeah. Go, and, and then you go to, to, to see the estate plan attorney and none of them are looking to make sure every single piece of the puzzle are working together. I cannot tell you how many people have come into my office and they have just, just 
opposite plans on each section of, of their retirement. The, their, their, their estate plan does not fit their, their income needs. Their income needs are a tax disaster, and their, their tax disaster causes worse disasters for the estate plan. They are not all working together, and that is a downfall in my profession, that too many of my the people in my industry say, it's not my job. I, I want to do one thing. I only want to do thing, and the rest of it, I can send you to somebody, but don't talk to me. Don't ask me. I think that is a huge disservice, and I think that's why too many people lose 20 to 30% right off to taxes, and I think that's why too many people, the probate process and the cost of going through probate, they lose tens of thousands of dollars. That's insane when you have a choice. Bruce, we're going to do something special for the next WCBM callers who are serious about retirement. My team and I are going to personally custom build a complete retirement plan for them. This is complimentary for the next five callers with 500000 or more saved for retirement. So get ready for retirement all under one roof. Call ProStatus Financial now, 866-597-1040, for your personalized complete retirement plan. That's 866-597-1040 and at ProStatusFinancial.com. Okay, now, uh, if you have that choice uh, and... I'm, I'm trying to draw the correct analogy. The, the easiest one I can think of is uh, you sit down at a restaurant uh, and you have uh, you have a wine list and you have your entrees um, and you have all these other things. And maybe, maybe you're at a restaurant that has a violinist who travels from table to table and, and you want to have the violinist come to your table and play something and you want to have a particular bottle of wine, you want to have a, a, a particular entree, a particular appetizer, and oh, by the way, you're going to want that uh, the chocolate souffle for dessert and that takes time to prepare. If you had to place those orders individually with the wine steward, with the musician, uh, with a waiter, with everybody, that's an equivalent situation. What you really need is one individual, a maitre d' in essence, who's going to say, Okay, uh, I I see what you want. I see what you want to do. Uh, I will coordinate all this for you. What you're saying is you would propose a kind of a one-stop shop uh, that does that kind of overview. Is that correct? Yeah, and I would say it's even worse than you know the five different parts of the restaurant. I would say that it's like having a, a wine steward from one restaurant making a wine recommendation, having uh, no yes, idea what the entree is going to be served by the restaurant that you're sitting in, that the violinist is coming up from the street from the, the Mexican restaurant that plays mariachi music even though you're an Italian restaurant. I mean, I think that's how bad it is. So, yes. Having somebody that can coordinate it all, that, that maitre d' that truly understands that you want to have an incredible experience on, at, for dining, you need that same maitre d'. You need that same stop to make sure that you have not only an incredible entree and dinner um, experience, but that you have an incredible retirement experience. And if you have somebody that can coordinate it all and make sure it all works together – to me, that's the ideal situation. That is a win for you. It's a win for your spouse or significant other. It's a win for your heirs. I mean, we're talking about being able to create a plan that's multi-generational. It could be tax efficient. You, you can accomplish- But that's a rich person's thing, people say. That's a rich person's thing. But rich people do that kind of stuff. I'm just a middle class Joe. I get up and I go to work every day. I can't afford to have a multi-generational plan. Do you know why Warren Buffett pays less taxes as a percentage of his income than his secretary does? It's because he has an advisor that helps him with the investments and helps him with his taxes and helps him with the estate plan. And you know what? You're right. Warren Buffett is a multi-billionaire, but he was smart enough to get himself in the lowest tax bracket legally possible. So everybody, I mean, if you're paying 12% taxes and you're, you know, because you're poor, you know, and I'm doing the air quotes, if you're paying 12% taxes, how about paying zero? That's more money in your pocket. If you're in the 22, how about paying 12 or paying zero? You have that option. So, you know, I, I understand that there's this perception that only rich people need an estate plan, that only rich people need tax planning. I, I get that. I get that. But the fact is, is that rich people need that less than everyday Americans. You know, you and I are the ones who pay the brunt of the taxes. You and I are the ones who suffer the consequences of, quite frankly, those clowns in Congress and the White House doing stupid things to us day in and day out and hoping we we don't notice exactly the type of crap they pull on us. And we're paying way too much in taxes. We pay way too much in death taxes. We pay way too much in probate fees. We pay way too much for everything because nobody's looking out for your best interest. And you think you don't deserve that type of attention that somebody with a billion dollars does. Well, I disagree. If you have 100000 if you have 500000 if you have a million dollars, heck, if you have $25,000, you worked hard for that money, and you deserve the same type of respect and, and, and credit for doing what you did 
to save 25000 as the guy who saved a million. He saved a million because he makes a crap ton of money. You save 25000 and you're on minimum wage. You should congratulate yourself, and you should be in a position to take advantage of the same thing that those rich folks get to take advantage of. Let me add another layer to this. Uh, with the spending that's going on in Washington, D.C., and it's been going on for a, for a while now. This doesn't all get at the feet of the current administration, although they kind of mastered the art, it seems to me, of this. Uh, I think, personally, it's almost inevitable uh, that we're going to see a devaluation of our currency. We're seeing it already, in essence, uh, because inflation is costing everybody to spend more for everything. If there are others who are as pessimistic about this as I am, uh, who are saying, yeah, well, you know what, all this stuff goes right out the window because they're going to devalue the dollar and I'm screwed anyway. Uh, is there a strategy you can follow uh, if you're making that assumption without saying, I'm going to get screwed anyway. If your assumption is they are going to devalue our currency. Uh, if you have 10% inflation, guess what? Every single paycheck, you earn less than the previous paycheck because the inflation robs that paycheck, which is the same number, of its spending value. So let's say you take this pessimistic view that I have. They're going to devalue the currency in one fashion or another. We're not gold standard. We're not silver standard. No more silver certificates. There's nothing that stabilizes the dollar. Or, alternately, if all of a sudden the yuan becomes the default currency of the world, then the dollar is not. How do you factor all that stuff in if you're just a normal Joe? Well, I mean, your, your talk about, you know, like a, a brick currency or the, the, the yuan being the reserve currency of Correct. the world, you know, that is catastrophic and devastating to the American economy. I mean, you know, Americans, I don't think, recognize how important it is for us to be the reserve of the world. Every trade pretty much in the whole world comes through the U.S. dollar. That is a almost a buttress to the, the the dollar not falling worse, especially when we have you know Tweedledee and Tweedledum fighting over the budget. I mean, like you said, they both cause the budget, and for one side to the and they both do it to each other to you know hold it hostage. That's absolutely insane. And, and we're on the same page. They need to cut spending. They need to figure out a, a way to to live within a budget because they expect us to do it right. So th- the fact is if. World currency changes from the dollar. We have lots of problems, almost to the point where I would argue guns, toilet paper, bullets, and water, and, and maybe for you know for our engineer Ira, maybe some wine. You know, that, that, that that might that might be the way to go. You mean more wine? More wine, yes, more wine. Um, <laughs> But you're right. You need to have some things that are going to be a buttress against that type of crazy inflation. But honestly, I am not certain that there is a a long term strategy. That will account for 10 to 12 percent inflation. Bury uh, uh, gold dollars in your backyard. Right. And even then it becomes problematic because how do you buy something with a gold brick? Right. And so yeah. all these people that have gold in their, in their mind's eye, they have gold, you know, because they old gold, gold ETFs or they have gold reserves in some vault someplace that, you know, some state. That's not what having gold in reserve means. Gold in reserve means exactly what you alluded to, that you have gold in your safe or buried in the backyard. Hopefully somebody can find it. You know, uh, silver certificates, actually having the, 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 the bullion and coin in your hand. If things get that dramatic, you need those things. But the flip side to it is, is that. How do you spend that? I mean, how do you actually use that in a currency thing to go buy a loaf of bread or to buy a cup of coffee or whatever it happens to be? And, you know, again, you know, being somewhat cynical, you know, a little bit you know, joking about it, but the people that have gold are going to lose the gold to the people that have bullets and guns. And so, yes, I think it is appropriate for everybody to have some gold in reserves. That makes perfect sense. You know, should it be 50% of your portfolio? I would argue probably not. But to have 5 or 10% of your allocation of your assets in precious metals that you physically hold as a hedge against crazy inflation, as a hedge against, you know, uncertainty in the, in the government, everybody thinks we're going to be here as the, the world's leader forever. You know, I think we're the greatest country in the world. But the fact is, is we are not always going to be number one at some point, maybe not my lifetime, maybe not your lifetime, but at some point, every number one becomes number two. Oh, and yeah, become- come on. No, the, the British crown was the reserve currency for the world for a long time. Then guess what? All of a sudden, you woke up in the morning, it's not. Right, right. And, I, and, I mean, and, it, and nobody, it happens that fast. Right, and, and now the British pound is a, a horrible place to be because it is losing value so quickly. 
so so yeah, I, I don't know that I have a, you know, here's the solution, here's how you handle a, a, a 10% inflation. I know that in our portfolios, the way we designed our portfolios is we assume there's going to be a 3.69% inflation rate. And historically- Long term. Long term. So we've always done our plan at 3.69. Historically, it's been closer to 2%. You know, we had this huge spike, but when our clients came to us and said, oh my gosh, you know, this 8 to 10%, what are we going to do? We at least had a, a, a buttress to it. We, we, you know, we could say, look, for the last seven years, we, we've put aside an extra 2% for when things like this happen. I can account for that. And quite frankly, if inflation gets up to that 12 to 14%, and what I would expect to happen is like we saw it during the Reagan administration, you know, you're going to have interest rates at 14 to 18%, and you're going to have inflation at you know, 14 to 18%. And it becomes sick, and it's this, this downward spiral, and it just becomes more and more stressful. And, you know, somebody hopefully like Reagan will come around. And, you know, when he and David Stockman broke this vicious cycle, they knew what they were doing. I mean, I, I thought it was kind of ingenious. Yeah, don't feed the beast. Right. Well, Just and, don't feed the beast. And that's what he did. He starved them. He starved the Treasury and forced people to make the changes. And, you know, they knew there were ramifications with it. But they changed the direction of the American economy by doing what they did. And, and even though, you know, the early 80s were still kind of rough and, and people talk about Bill Clinton having the best economy ever, it wasn't because Bill Clinton did something specific. It was because of the stepping stones that Reagan put into place that Clinton got to benefit from, right? I mean, got it. You know, so, so, so there are some things that they can do. I don't know that they have the, the guts to do it right. anymore. I mean, that's the problem with our politicians now. It's all about 30-second sound bites and, and kowtowing to whoever's screaming in their face at that minute. They, they do not have the guts to do what it takes to do. When a couple Republicans brought up the idea that they have to do something about Social Security. Well, I got news for you, folks. Social Security is a mess. We need to do something about it. But you can't even have an intelligent conversation about what do we need to do about Social Security because if a a Republican brings it up, the Democrats start screaming about, oh, you're going to take away everybody's Social Security. That's not what they said. They said we need to address it. How can we fix our problems if they can't even get out of their own way of a 30-second soundbite that they can put on TV so they look good to their constituency? Uh, I don't know if you recall, back in the day, uh, my first condominium, the first home that I bought, was a condominium I bought during the Carter years. Wild (laughs) guess. I had good credit rating. I had no red flags. What would my interest rate have been? Mm, Somewhere between 12 and 14. 17%. Holy crap. 17% mortgage rate. Uh, that is what we're looking at unless we turn this ship around. Right. And, and that makes anything more than a condo unaffordable for virtually everybody in the world. Well, a- a- absolutely. I mean, that's a problem you're seeing now where people just can't afford. You know, I, I don't know that we get down to the 2 to 3% interest rates we had for, you know, the, the basically through the 2010 to th- 2020 era. But certainly at 5 and 6%, I think that that's a realistic place for us to get back to at some point where it then becomes affordable for people to buy. Like you, I mean, I bought my first house in 1986, and I think I was at 12.5%. You know, and, and you're right. Today, people cannot afford to buy a home at 75 and 8.5% interest. It's too expensive. And it, it shocks me that I still get people come in and call and say, I'm thinking about taking money out of my house to buy this or pay this off. And I'm like, are you nuts? I mean... You refinance a house, you have an interest rate at 3.5% now, and you refinance into 7 or 8? Oh, the guy told me that we do it at 7 or 8 for 4 or 5 years, and then we'll refinance back down. Yeah, yeah I'm like Assuming. You. Yeah, I just don't think back down is, is realistic. Not, yeah. not enough to make a difference. I just don't think that happens. So call 866-597-1040, 866-597-1040. The last thing you need is for your money to go down right before retirement. 866-597-1040 or ProStatusFinancial.com. Advisory services offered through ProStatus Financial Advisors Group, a registered investment advisor, insurance licensed in Maryland. ProStatus Financial Advisors Group, LLC, is not licensed in all 50 states. To find out if ProStatus Financial Advisors Group is licensed in your state, please call 410-863-1040. ProStatus Group, LLC, is not affiliated with nor endorsed by the Social Security Administration or any other government agency and does not provide legal or tax advice. Annuity guarantees rely solely on the financial strength and claims-paying ability of the issuing insurance company. By contacting us, you may be provided with information about insurance and annuity products offered through representatives of ProStatus Financial Advisors Group.